Good evening. I'd like to call the September 12th Board of Education meeting to order and welcome Alexandra Capel as our new student government representative for this year. And she will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would like a motion to, I'd like to move an order of, of business. I would like to move the communications and recognitions uh, before the board presentation. Could I have a motion? Always helps when you turn on your mic. So I move the motion as you said, Alexa. Thank you. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so we will have our board presentations. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> our communications and recognitions. Van will lead us off. We're very proud this evening to recognize our very own member of the National Distinguished Principals Class of 2019, Alicia Sweet Daw. And we have a few special guests. Would you all come in, please? Some uh, dignitaries joining us this evening to share in this celebration include the Connecticut State Representative, Kate Rotella. Kate? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, you're not crying already. Are you crying already? <laughs> so I am very, very proud to be here um, to read. So I have a um, citation here for you from the General Assembly. It's an official citation that was introduced by myself, Representative Kate Rotella, and Senator Heather Summers. Be it hereby known that, to, known to all that the Connecticut General Assembly hereby offers its sincerest congratulations to Alicia Sweet Daw in recognition of being awarded the Connecticut Elementary School Principal of the Year Award. The entire membership extends its very best wishes on this memorable occasion and expresses the hope of continued success. Given this day, September 12th, 2019 at the State Capitol in Hartford. And it is signed by our President Pro Temp, Martin Looney, our Speaker of the House, Joe, and our Secretary of State, Denise Merrill. Thank you so much for all you do. Alicia, will you come up here, please? I have a very special um, something for you this evening. We noticed that your shoes didn't match, so we... <laughs> so, here's, here's the shoe. And here's some Kleenex, because we have another, some other special guests. <laughs> we have Alicia's husband, George, and their daughters, Abigail, Addison, and Arlie. And they have something to present to Alicia.
Atlas. I know for the first time in my life. <laughs> I'm so overwhelmed. Did you see that? My mom and dad. Well, as she cries, um, I'd like to just uh, make a few comments. Alicia, as we all know, is a high energy educator with a focus on successful achievement for every single student in her school. Her collaborative and mission driven leadership and laser like focus on student and school data has led to continuous improvements at West Broad Street and West Vine Street schools. Early in October, Alicia will be traveling to Washington, D.C. to be honored by the National Association of Elementary School Principals. She will join other honorees from across the country as they're recognized at the national level for their unparalleled contributions to the field of education and their dedication to our youngest students. The Connecticut Association of School named Alicia as the Connecticut Elementary Principal of the Year last spring and she will be formally awarded the honor on October 23rd at a celebration of Distinguished Administrator Ceremony in Portland. We certainly hope many of you can join us that evening to recognize her once again and make her cry for the third or fourth time. <laughs> Congratulations, Alicia. And we, are, we voted the leadership team, as long as you put on the correct shoe, you'll be allowed to leave with your family tonight and go to dinner. I swear to all of you, two seconds. I, 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 I promise this will be two seconds. Um, I have said this, I, and I will say it from the rooftops. Um, this is a reflection of the most incredible group of teachers a principal could have. I am blessed every day, and this is truly a reflection on your work that you do day in and day out. I wouldn't be who I am without you, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I have the most outstanding assistant principal that who finishes my sentences, can, can basically, she knows my thoughts as I'm walking in. So this, is, this truly is a reflect, and, and I say this to Marianne all the time, I work for an administrative team that, like, it, they're absolutely incredible. I am so blessed to work with them. We work together, we work so hard. Um, and we have a board of ed that's so supportive of us. And I am honored to bring this not only to um, our community in Pocaduck, but Stonington as a whole. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I am truly the lucky one. And obviously, if it wasn't for my family, um, I would not be where I am today because I have their support day in and day out. So thank you for surprising me. And for all of those who receive Snapchats and text messages, and pictures this morning of my shoes. Yes, I came to work today with a navy and a black pair of heels today. No, not today. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I, you, you as usual, blew, blew me away tonight. So thank you. I'm very honored. Very, very honored. Thank you.
Now, so much for the fun. <laughs> Congratulations to Alicia. We're always happy to celebrate her, and she brings tears to our eyes. Thank you very much. Now we have our M&M presentation, or Marianne and Mark. Yes, for those of you who didn't understand why you had M&Ms on we your... We didn't. Okay. <laughs> why you had M&Ms on your uh, tabletops is because it's the Mark and Marianne third annual Butler Freeze uh, presentation on school uh, student performance and achievement. Uh, so we thought that would be appropriate that you have some M&Ms tonight. So uh, we're going to just take a, a few minutes to kind of go over both the um, newly released data on Smarter Balance assessment scores, uh, three metrics specifically, and then Mark's going to go over a little bit of information on the high school achievement as far as SATs and AP courses as well. And we're happy to entertain any questions that you have. I just want to tell the board that this is a very high level report on Smarter Balance because at teaching and learning we drill down to a deeper level. You will also hear more about individual school scores when the principals come to teaching and learning and present their school improvement plans, okay? So just so you know, this is district level data today. All right, we're gonna go um, through, go ahead, Steve. Um, just to refresh your memory, because I know this is uh, something that you probably think about once a year, and that's, that's it. So there's three metrics that we're going to go over tonight um, that relate to the Smarter Balanced Assessment. This is a test that is administrated, administrated in grades three through eight in English language arts and in mathematics. The traditional measurement that you're very, very familiar with is the performance scores, which give you an idea of where students land on one of four levels. Um, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about a, a recent, a fairly recently new metric, which is the growth rate. And then also we're going to talk about the average uh, percentage of target achieved for each one of those measures. And I'm going to go through, like a second grader, what each one of those measurements actually means so you can keep it clear in your mind, okay? So the performance scores are the ones you're probably most familiar with. So there's four levels, one being the lowest, four being the highest. They correspond to not meeting the standards in those content areas, approaching the standards, meeting the standards, or exceeding the standards. 
I wanted to go over this because I want you to keep in mind that within each of those bands, there are two sub bands that we use when we talk about percent target achieved and we talk about growth rates. So it's really important in your mind to visualize that there's a low one, a high one, a low two, a high two, a low three, a high three, a low four, a high four. Make sense? Okay. You don't see that when you look at a performance score. You just get a one, two, three, four. Okay. The second one is growth rate, okay? This is really a binary function, so it's an, uh, it's an all or nothing. Did the particular student make their growth rate, their target that was individually set for them based on the previous year's performance goals? So in other words, a, a student that's performing at a high two is gonna have a different target than a student that's actually performing at a high three. So did they make their particular personalized goal or not? Does that make it clear? All or nothing. The, th the third, on, on that growth rate, we don't get rated on that for our report card. It's this next one that is the one that is, is the weight of the points on our report card that you see around the holidays. This is the average of percentage of target achieved of all students tested within a content area. So in other words, if, if we, we collectively take an exam, how much of the, our personal target did we each re uh, reach? So it's almost like we get collectively get a grade. So the higher to 100%, the better the grade. Does that make sense? It's our collective growth towards our particular personalized target. It's not a percentage of children, it's how we kind of collectively scored on our own targets. Make sense? Okay, all right. So I wanted to just kind of show you over the past four years where we stack up against the state of Connecticut. Every time you see on the screen or on your handout that we're gonna go over in a few minutes, yellow highlighting, that means we actually bumped up, we increased our performance as compared to the previous year. So the state of Connecticut in English language arts came in this year at an average of 55.7, Stonington at a 77.1. No surprise, and we should be well above the state average. That's where we wanna be. Um, in mathematics, 48.1, uh, for the state and 66.4 uh, for, the, for the district. Remember that our, one of our uh, district improvement goals last year has been mathematics, so I want you to kind of keep an eye on those scores because there's been some pretty exciting growth there, okay? Our growth rate, again, now this is the binary function. The, the kids made it their target or they did not make their target. Um, so in English language arts, we had almost half of our children meet their personalized target, 48.8%. In mathematics, look at that jump, 38.2 last year up to 51.3. So that tells us something. It tells us our district data team that actually takes a look at this information during the year, reallocated resources, including human resources, talent, Tina Eisenbeis to be specific. Um, it made a difference. And so we have to be very, very proud of that. That is no small uh, jump. I also want to say that we saw a lot of um, growth at the middle school level, at both middle schools last year, and so I want to give a nod to those people and to our curriculum team and some solid performance at the elementary levels as well. Percent of average target achieved in English language arts uh, compared to last year, look at that jump from 58.8 to 62.67.2, uh, and then again a big jump in mathematics, 69.7 from the, the mid-50s. So a lot to be proud of here. That tells us a little bit that we're not moving just kids at the top, we're moving all kids. So that makes me, my heart sing with a um, sensitivity towards equity. So what you have in front of you is a handout. A lot of times we get questions, especially at teaching and learning, we talk about, well, how are we stacking up against our neighbors? Because you know we are a tad competitive here in, in Stonington. Um, so I, what I did is I just put together four different districts that are in the, the area um, to show you where we stack up not only with performance but with growth rates and with uh, percentage target achieved. The first one is East Lyme and you're going to notice again that anytime you see yellow we are outperforming that district. So you notice that Stonington uh, is outperforming uh, East Lyme in ELA, not in mathematics but we're pretty close. But if you take a look at our growth rate and our average uh, target achieved in those other content areas, both English language arts and mathematics, we're, we're ahead of the game there compared to East Lyme. You also have the same kind of information for Ledyard. You can see that there's more yellow than not for Waterford and also for Montville. So I thought that would give you an idea that we're really moving in the right direction and I think um, I wanna thank you for your support 
in actually supporting uh, curriculum positions because it does make a difference. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Mark now. Our takeaways are that our data team uh, is actually working, that we have given a lot of attention to curriculum and instruction from a coaching perspective, that curriculum matters. We've invested in that, and I appreciate that. Um, and that we're moving all, all kids forward, not just, again, the, the kids at the top, not just looking at those performance numbers, because when you start to look at the growth target and the percentage target achieved, it tells you a different story when you, when you dig deeply about what's really going on. And now, the Admiral. Mark. All right. Um, all right, I'm just going to just continue on because I think you're going to see a theme follow up with the high school as well where we're seeing a lot of growth here in the SAT and the AP world as, as well. Um, one of the first things I want to do is I just want to make sure everybody understands the SAT benchmarks, right? Because when they see them and they look at, you know, like us, 73% uh, proficient in uh, evidence-based reading and writing and 53% proficient or meeting the benchmark in math, Many people think that, well, 53% in math, that's not really all that great. But it is important to understand what the College Board is using as their benchmark. For the evidence-based reading and writing, as it states there, if somebody has met the benchmark, they have a 75% chance of getting a C or better in most of the humanities types courses, social sciences, English, writing, and the like. All right? When you look at math, the next one, is the very similar, but now we're talking 75% chance of getting a C in everything from algebra stats all the way up to calculus. And we know there are a lot of people who are completely prepared for college that might not even touch a calculus course or a pre-calculus course for that matter their entire life. You know, so it is a, a much different metric when you're really comparing the, the, what, what their actual target is at the, at the college level. So we're pretty proud of what we've been doing up here at the high school. Here's our scores for 2019. Uh, we have 552 and 532 for a composite of 1,084. Uh, we're 76% uh, met the benchmark, or our students met the benchmark for, uh, for ERW and 53% math. And you can see the ratings where we're 36, 32nd for both of those levels in, uh, against all the districts in the state. So, you know, that's very high. And we've, We've really grown in the last three or four years. So five or six years ago, we were about in the 40th to 50th percentile. So, I mean, we're really moving up. Our kids are doing great and our teachers are doing great. Uh, these are the composite scores over the last four years since we, took, since we started taking the SAT as the, as the metric in Connecticut. And, you know, it, it goes up and down. And, and we will see that continue as the tests Sometimes the tests are harder each year on some years, and you will see some you know, peaks and valleys as we go forward. All right, so there was the first one was math, then the ERW, and this is this, you know, a comparison to the state, and you'll notice that those differences are very similar to what you saw in the SBAC results. So we're maintaining that difference between that higher level than the state average as the kids get older. <coughs> um, head to the next one, please. And here's really that showing that differential. Uh, we're averaging about 30 different, 30 higher than the state average in both math and uh, evidence-based reading and writing across the board as we move forward. So the kids are performing, the teachers are making sure the kids are aware of what they need to know in order to be uh, competitive in these tests. It has been very, very helpful to have the PSAT 9 and 10 in the high school the last couple of years, where kids are understanding the test a little bit, we don't teach multiple choice tests very often in the classes. We really like to do a, a lot more uh, open-ended and really get them thinking. But there is an art to take in a, a multiple choice test. And by having these opportunities each year is, is very helpful for the students. I think that's really given them a little bit of a leg up. And you know, so once again, they, they look pretty stable. But when you look on the next slide, when we start looking at the growth, and you have a better, you have a better picture of it in your packets that you will be that you have, but you can see the trajectory where, if you really want to look at a curriculum-based uh, assessment, if the whole if the whole cadre of students for that particular test is all as an average is in the green, so to speak, you know, met the the benchmarks, 
things are, things are on the right place. You know, and we have an upward trajectory for 9, 10, and 11. You know, if you looked at our graduating class, you know, they, they've met the benchmarks of what they predicted based on their scores each year. Right, so we're meeting what the college board thinks that the kids should be having. Right. And once again, just like with Marianne, you know, we like to know where we stack. On the left-hand side, you'll see where we stack against the, the regional schools. And I just took the ECC schools you know, that we compete against in sports. So I figured we'd put them up to see where we compete in, uh, in SAT as well. And we're third for both math and, and the ERW. Uh, with only marine science and Wheeler being above us this year. And, and once again, there's fluctuation from year to year on, on you know, where, these, where these schools are. But we've been pretty much the last four years, we've been in the top, thir top three or four in this particular comparison. Right, one, go back one more time, please, Stephen. On the right, we don't really do the DERGs in Connecticut anymore, but this is comparison against other schools that have similar socioeconomic uh, landscape in their districts and we're you know pretty high on that level as well you know with schools like EO Smith and Farmington and West Hartford being the ones that are above us so our kids are really really performing AP doing the same thing you know we're challenging the students we have over the last couple years we're having more and more kids take AP tests uh, our, our thoughts and philosophy is that if they want to take the challenge we're going to give it to them all right, and our teachers have, uh, do a great job of accommodating whoever's in the test. And, and you'll see that in one of the awards I want to show, share with you at the end. But uh, one more time, as you can see, those are just a number of AP scholars. And we had 51 scholars last year, 53 scholars this year. I mean, kids, when they take the test, they are succeeding. A special point there and the, on the bottom there, the bold, the last two years, we've had national AP scholars, and those, pe those are students that have had uh, you know, basically eight tests, scores of four or more. I'm going to say her name, if you don't mind. Okay. Caroline, you know, who sat up there with you last year, fives on eight tests. I mean, she, it was phenomenal. I mean, we don't, that, that's not very often. That's, you don't even see that on their stats that they give you because national AP scholars are just not that common. And we've had two in the last two years, so that's pretty incredible. Now, um, just the multi-year report, you can see in the top there the number of AP students and the number of exams we've given. We're, it's more and more. You know, we're, we want the kids to take the challenge. We want the kids to think that they can succeed and then go show us that they do. All right? and, and that was evidenced by this next slide, which shows that last year we were awarded the ninth annual AP District Honor Roll, where we were one of 373 schools in the United States and Canada who increased participation and maintained at least 80% success rate for the kids taking the test. Yeah, so that's just, uh, that's uh, as a tribute to all of our teachers because they're taking those kids, even the ones that maybe years ago wouldn't have taken the test, that they're challenging themselves and the teachers are accommodating and making them prepared. And then also, what, one more Steve, and you're, the, the AP Computer Science Female Diversity Award, you know, you know, we've been talking about computer science as you know, the, the, that everybody should have some going into the future because everything's ran by a computer. Even pretty soon, people are going to be ran by computers. But you know, our AP Computer Science, we have a lot of females that are going through that, and we we're awarded this as well. And this next slide, Stephen, thank you. This is just I want to do a little bit of closure because if you recall, we had a couple of our AP students came and talked about some of their projects that they were doing. All right, I'm not going to say too much about it because it's their story to tell, but. We just got word in the last couple of weeks that a couple of them have to take a year off of college because I guess you can't go to school and, and handle a multi-million dollar investment from a company who wants to take your project and go forward with it worldwide. So uh, they came back and, and talked to some of our kids at the end of last year just to kind of get them going. So, you know, that's, that, that, and that is the theme of everything we do here at the high schools. What can we do? Imagine everything. Right. So thank you. So our, our last one is really to leave you with, so what does this mean? Obviously our kids are high school ready when they come out of the middle schools and they're college and career ready when they come out of our high school. Uh, what does it mean for our future work? Because you know we're only as good as our, our last uh, set of data. So we're gonna keep, keep developing our K 
to, through 12 curricula. Over the last two years, um, we've made some great, great strides in that arena. And I think our, uh, our data is, is showing that not only are we uh, writing it, but we're implementing it and monitoring it, and it's making a difference. Uh, so we're going to continue those two goals. We're also going to continue to support a positive district climate for all of our staff and our students. And we're going to take um, a, a real hard look at uh, recruiting and retaining our high quality staff that we have here in Stonington, um, because we're on the right track and we think we've got a great district here. So are there any questions that you have for us? You are all cordially invited to teaching and learning when the accountability report comes in, and I'm happy to entertain any questions at that level as well. Thank you. My only comment or question is we did not get um, the packet, and so if we could have that emailed to us, you that sure would be great. Can. Absolutely. Thank you. No questions for Marianne or Mark? Okay, thank you very much. Next is Mr. Smith. Good evening. I'm very pleased to announce, in case you didn't know, Stonington Middle School uh, opened on September 3rd. After several years of planning and a lot of work, uh, it is now in operating in functional reality. Um, so I just want to kind of review our opening. I want to start uh, a little out of order in that uh, I want to report that we had Stonington Middle School's first ever back to school night last night. And I have to give uh, credit to our team. We wanted to come up with an experience for parents um, that was not the typical back to school night, forced march through every single class where you only get to spend six minutes uh, with teachers. Uh, we came up with a way of dividing uh, into two sessions so that we could handle the parking and traffic. And we did it by letter of the alphabet so that parents who have multiple kids can come for one session and still have an opportunity to meet with all of the teachers, not just the core academic teachers, but all of the survey teachers uh, and the related services staff. And I have to say, in the 10 plus years that I've been doing back to school nights, this is the first time ever that I didn't have at least one parent come up to me at the end and say, this was the worst thing ever. <laughs> Uh, it, it's a tough night for a lot of folks, and uh, uh, it was a very warm, relaxed, and comfortable uh, feeling throughout the night in all of the individual sessions. Uh, we started uh, as a whole group in the, in the gym, and then they broke out into two sessions, um, and even the parking lot worked out. Uh, it was r really amazing. Uh, we had all the staff hide their cars behind the building while still observing uh, fire lanes and whatnot and the parking and traffic uh, was, was pretty smooth. So all in all, a very, very successful night. I think uh, for parents, again, you know, communication has been uh, kind of a lingering question and we've tried to communicate in a wide variety of ways. Just getting them in the building and being able to talk to them, I think finally put a lot of that anxiety to rest. They've, their kids are in the school, they're, had a, a week or so of operating the school. They were in last night getting all of their questions answered by the people who are working directly with their kids and it was a very, very good night. So just to recap uh, what we did facilities wise uh, at Stonington Middle School, I've covered this in previous meetings. Uh, the biggest uh, things that we accomplished uh, this summer in, in order to rebrand the school as Stonington Middle School uh, was the complete redo of the gym floor uh, with the resurfacing of the floor, painting the entire gym. Um, we have new padding that was the only thing that didn't come in before the school opening. It came in yesterday. Uh, it's going to be installed on the 25th uh, on the half day when there's no kids uh, in the afternoon. 
which will complete that project. One of the nice things was we had already uh, had a project to replace the gym lighting with more energy efficient LED lighting. And while the energy saving is great, uh, the, the brightness of those lights in comparison to what was in there just makes the whole gym uh, come alive and be very bright, clean, and sleek. Um, in the cafeteria, same thing. We painted the whole cafeteria. We did get new cafeteria tables in and installed. Um, one of the features uh, of that that is working out really well is we added 10 round tables uh, in addition to five of the typical longer tables with higher capacity. And it's really making the cafeteria work for students because round tables work for people because you get to see everybody at your table and talk at a normal volume instead of having to yell all the way down the line to talk to the guy at the end. Um, so even with uh, way more kids in the cafeteria, about 120 kids versus the last few years of 80 some odd kids, the noise and the environment in the cafeteria is much more manageable with those round tables. Um, also, we created the two new classrooms uh, on the ground floor or the garden level, as I like to refer to it. Um, in the past few years, the only room downstairs that was actually in use for students was the art room. Now the entire ground floor is in use by students. We have a second art space in uh, a room that used to be a computer lab down there. And then we subdivided uh, the large room into two separate rooms to create a world language suite with a Spanish room on one side and a French room on the other. We worked on the parking lot, got it resurfaced, uh, restriped. We also did a, a French drain to help with the ice problem in the wintertime. Uh, the test will be, you know, later this winter. I'm sure Peter will be stopping over to see if it actually worked. Uh, we think it will. And then we did a lot of work around the front of the building with landscaping, cleaning everything up, giving a nice open, uh, sleek look, new signage, um, and really kind of uh, rebranded the whole front of the school in that way. The one thing that is not complete that we're getting closer day by day is we're also, we also subdivided a space across from our nurses clinic for the school-based health center. Uh, the school-based health center is in the process now of whenever they move to a new location, they have to get recertified. Um, we need to get some fax lines installed uh, before we can get that done. But we're looking uh, at sometime, uh, probably second week in October, to get that school-based health center up and running and open for all of the middle school students of Stonington. So I'm going to run through some of the, the features that I think are the most important uh, that consolidating the middle schools has provided uh, for the middle school students of Stonington. And the first one is our extended learning time period. In the past, at both middle schools, this block has had a lot of names. It's the, really the fifth academic block of the day, which has really been a catch-all. It's been called ice block. It's been called a flex block, workshop block, intervention block. And it was a very difficult block to manage because its primary function was to provide a block of time for kids who need remediation and intervention without pulling them out of core academic classes or having them not have uh, art or uh, a related services uh, class, which we you know, don't want to do either. And it was really kind of unwieldy in that um, most of the heavy remediation needs were in reading and math. And so we had to divide this, we had the whole grade level in that period, we had to divide it among the four grade level teachers. And so we were asking social studies and science teachers to remediate kids in reading and math, rather than their language arts teacher and their math teacher. We also uh, had some disparity between the two schools with the intervention specialists, some funded by Title I, uh, some not. Um, so what we were able to do by consolidating is we pulled the world language class out of its typical survey rotation and made it the cornerstone of the fifth academic period and the extended learning time period opposite that. So they have the world language class on one day and the extended learning time class on the other. What this does is those extended learning class 
is now are only taught by language arts teachers and math teachers. So we have the content specialists addressing the needs in their content fields. And this is one of the things that freed up science and social studies teachers to do an encore, but that's another slide. Uh, the other thing that it does is with the consolidation, we now have all of our interventionists in one building. So when a group of math students are with their math teacher in an ELT block, the kids who really need those tier two and tier three interventions are being pulled out of there by the interventionists, leaving the math teacher with a smaller group of students performing at a higher level where they can do more meaningful enrichment and reinforcement. So we really think as good as uh, our numbers were last year, and, and I think when we present, you'll see that they were pretty good, um, this model gives us the ability to really improve the growth numbers even more because we've set these courses up by the quarter so that we can move kids in and out from an LA uh, intervention block to a math block and back. We can move kids who suddenly pop up on our uh, response to intervention and do true response to inter intervention. We can put them in a math ELT for a quarter, give them that targeted instruction, measure it, and if they're good to go, we can move them you know, uh, to another, uh, to the language arts block or an enrichment block. Uh, we really think it's going to uh, really pay dividends in the long run for those growth scores and really getting uh, our hands on kids that, that giving them what they need. I'll give you another example about how this is paying dividends for us. One of our problems uh, at the middle school level with math is for the kids who take the geometry class in, in eighth grade math, they essentially skip the eighth grade math year and everything that's in the eighth grade curriculum. They do well in geometry because they're, they're high achieving math students. Sometimes where that starts to rear its head is at the high school level when they get into algebra one and algebra two because they've missed that eighth grade curriculum in its entirety. The other thing that we struggle with at the middle school level with the geometry is we need to teach some of those algebra concepts like Pythagorean theorem and some of those equation things in order to do the geometry. So this year, all of our sections of geometry, all of those kids, first quarter, are in an extended learning block with their geometry teacher as a group. And Tina Eisenbeis created a curriculum for them to follow in that first quarter, which does both. It gives them the algebra uh, concepts that they need for the geometry, and it takes the key concepts from the eighth grade year boils them down and gives them kind of a booster shot of the stuff they're not going to get. Uh, we hope that will pay dividends uh, here at the high school level in, in higher math because the, they really, even though they're great math students, they're getting now a booster shot of those key eighth grade math curriculum uh, essential outcomes. So the, the bright shiny thing at Stonington Middle School is by changing the schedule in this way, we were able to create this concept of encore classes. And again, just where this came from, it was really kind of a joint effort of surveying, surveying students, what kind of courses would you be interested in? And surveying, surveying staff saying, if you could teach anything you want, what would you teach? And trying to make some of those matches and coming up with courses. And again, I'd like to thank Jen Bausch and the entire curriculum team for being able to write curriculum for all of these courses, basically uh, in the spring and through the summer. So currently, first semester, all survey, uh, all encore classes are a one semester course that meet every other day for half the year. So first semester, we are offering 21 encore classes. There are five new music classes, including guitar, keyboards, music tech, music composition, and a bell choir. There are four science encore classes, biomedical engineering, forensics, climate change, and engineering by design. There's five health and physical activity encore classes, fit for life, international sports, 20th century sports and history, personal health and safety, and unified living. In addition, we have a couple of social studies offerings, one called Cracking History, which is about how to think like a historian and how to work with primary documents. 
um, and Behind the Digital Curtain, which is about this concept of privacy in our digital world. In addition to that, we have uh, classes offered in photography, coding, a class in the library called Books and Beyond, and a class uh, for public speaking. So that's semester one. We're, we'll offer at least that many classes in semester two. They may be the same classes. We will resurvey the students uh, towards the end of semester one to, again, try to give kids uh, another shot at their preferences. And plus, we just felt it would be more appropriate not to uh, schedule second semester until the kids have seen the classes, experienced them, and can make a more informed choice. Uh, but we're really excited about these classes, um, and it's a great opportunity to create more than 20 new learning opportunities for our middle school students. The other thing that consolidation uh, did for us is help us get back into compliance and have health classes for all uh, it, in each grade. At both middle schools, with the declining enrollment uh, in years past, some FTEs in PE and health were reduced at both schools. And for the last few years at both schools, uh, a health class was only offered to fifth graders and eighth graders. So we've restored uh, a health class six, seven, eight, and again, Jen Bausch and the curriculum team rewrote that curriculum, made sure it aligned with the state standards and got us back on track with a health class for every single grade at the middle school level. So our biggest job at Stonington Middle School and the opening was to build our new learning and academic community. And we did a lot of work on that over the last year, in March, uh, during the conference days, we brought each grade level over to Mystic, did activities with them. We did joint PD all year with both staffs. And more recently, we had the high school link crew uh, do orientations for all of our incoming middle school students. But we also knew that that job really needs to be done when everybody's under one roof. It can't be done ahead of time. In order for it to be true and organic, and authentic, we need to be together in the building as a whole staff and as a whole student body. So we were very mindful about how we started the school year. Uh, day one, uh, we really didn't have uh, academic classes. We had activities, assemblies, and breakout sessions where we talked about expected behavior, routines, and how to be a member of the community, and really tried to invest front-loading time in that activities. Uh, in those activities. The other thing that's on a schedule for tomorrow is we have our one book in a day program where t for tomorrow we will be scheduling all of our classes, but in those classes the whole student body, every kid will have a copy of the book and we will read the book cover to cover as a school. There are activities uh, around the book. The book is called Inside Out and Back Again. And we very purposefully uh, chose this. Uh, Noreen Elliott, uh, sixth grade language arts teacher, took the lead on this because the, the book is written uh, in verse, so it's a, able to be parsed out and, and in a lot of quick reads. Um, but the themes of the book uh, promote school spirit through shared reading experience, emphasize the importance of reading in every single classroom because the gym teachers will be reading this book uh, with the kids. Uh, the math teachers will be reading the book with, the, with everyone. Uh, the book promotes discussions on bullying. It promotes discussions about adjusting to new surroundings. Uh, and we have activities around which we can brainstorm with kids on how to make our school welcoming for everybody. And the goal of accomplishing reading an entire book in a single day and just enjoying a really good story is what our goals are for tomorrow. So I'm going to end, and uh, Steve, can you? Oh, it's going to. No, I need you to. So this is a, a quick video uh, that was uh, edited for us by uh, Stonington High School student Caleb Sylvia uh, by special request about our opening day.
there's better music than my cheesy piano, but. Thank you. Questions? I have one question thing about what you said twenty one encore classes. How many students are in process in your classes? Process. Um, every student has at least one, so four hundred and eighty I guess would be uh, the answer on that. Is that um, sixth through eighth grade? The sixth graders also are able to take the encore classes? No, sixth grade, uh, it's just seven and eight with the encore classes, so I guess the answer would be 140 less than that. But what we did is we created um, a PE and health encore-like class for the sixth grade that they have in their regular survey block that is a health, wellness, and movement class. Um, that's the one that they're getting. How is parking for the staff? Is there, are there enough spots? There are, <laughs> kind of. The, one of the things uh, that we've been uh, kind of working on is the whole traffic flow, uh, the bus, parent pickup. Um, so while the, the correct answer to that question is yes, there is absolutely enough parking for staff, one of the issues that we're still working through is we have a number of our part-time paras who need to leave right at the end of school to go to another job. Mm -hmm. And so if you drive by you, on any given day, you will see kind of a jumble of cars down on the grass right now uh, because they need to be able to get out and not get trapped by the buses. We have started the solution to that in that um, uh, when we were planning the parent, moving the parent pickup back to the middle parking lot uh, in the academic entrance at the end of the building, my plan, as well documented, 
was to, <laughs> to keep the cars from backing up onto McStuxet Avenue was to have two lines of cars uh, and only load the students on the long sidewalk from the end of the academic wing down to the stop sign on McStuxet. Officer Page, being a police officer of uh, you know, lots of experience, said it actually would work better if we only had one lane stacked up and had a travel lane so that as kids got loaded, and we do have a crossing guard there to cross them uh, into the parking lot to load them in their parents' cars there in addition to the long sidewalk, that we would get more movement and it would prevent the backup. So he's mostly right. We've, we had one day where the cars did back up a little bit onto Miss Tuxet, but by and large, it is working better going with the police officer's uh, traffic management. Go figure, three college degrees. I thought I'd beat them. Um, so the other thing that that does, by leaving that travel lane open, we just have to train our employees who need to leave to go to another job to park, to back into those spots opposite that. So they actually, during the parent pickup there, they would have the opportunity to leave without parking on the grass. So that's one of the solutions we're working on. The other thing is we're, we're, we did a, a, another iteration of the bus dismissal uh, today that worked much better than what we've been doing uh, to get the buses out on time uh, so that they're on time for their elementary routes. Uh, we do have two waves of buses. We load eight buses at a time uh, and we just hold uh, the kids in the second wave in their classroom a few minutes. Uh, and then release them and by the time they get to their locker and get outside we've already rolled the first wave and, and then they can load the second eight buses and go and it was much much better today and again we're just fine-tuning some of that operational stuff sure Jack. one of one of my concerns all along has been the uh, length of time that a student would sit on a bus it's mm -hmm. coming from say Pocketuck yep um, have you tracked that and what 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 would that be that's really more of a question i guess for for peter anderson i don't really do the bus routes um and if you don't have the answer it can be some other time i'm just curious right now we're uh working out a couple long bus rides uh but we're the goal is to keep it below 30 minutes i can i can say this uh, mr morehouse uh one of the uh, issues that I have been dealing with with a couple of parents is one of the Pocketuck buses, um, bus six, is late uh, getting the kids home. They're not necessarily on the bus that long, but um, it's one of the. It has been one of the later buses arriving, and so it was always one of the last buses to load. Um, initially, in the first few days, what we were trying to do was uh, stagger the buses and do multiple waves and. Uh, it was just taking too long. Uh, so I know first student made some kind of adjustment because it's the high school run that bus six does that makes it one of the last buses uh, here. And that's one of our challenges is with the high school runs on any given day, there may be four high school kids on that bus. On a rainy day when there's no sports practice, there may be 44 kids on that bus. So they arrive at the middle school in a random order. It's based on as quickly as they can finish their high school uh, runs, they show up. Uh, so we're hoping that this new two-wave system that we started today will get all of those buses, including bus six, just out on the road quicker. Any other questions for Mr. Smith? Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Do we have comments from citizens? I'll just hold it. <laughs> um, I'm Ron Marcelia, Amy Drive, Pocketuck. So um, I'm here tonight on behalf of the building committee, and I want to talk about long-term facility equity for the elementary schools. And so I'm specifically thinking about PTO spending and what will happen with that over the course of time. Um, so the, as we've talked about several times, the building committee focused on driving equity 
into the buildings, and I think the administrators and staff did an outstanding job of, of accomplishing that in their efforts in designing the buildings with the architects. Um, really, the only difference, the only difference between West Vine and Dean's Mill is that Dean's Mill has four more classrooms. Otherwise, those buildings are equal in every way. Um, so obviously, like I said, our concern is that um, the PTOs, once they get going, will start to bring that disparate facility appearance to the district. Um, we had that before we started the project, and um, we're concerned that that could happen again. Um, the justification for that is looking at your enrollment. Um, obviously, there are several reasons uh, for the concern of PTO spending, but um, the most obvious reason uh, that we're concerned about this is the larger student body population at Dean's Mill School. It appears there's about 120 more students at that school than at West Vine. Uh, so, and then obviously there's maybe not 120 families, but a lot more families that can donate to the PTO at Dean's Mill. Um, so, um, just briefly, I don't know that I, I don't have a solution for this. Um, and I'm not gonna stand here and propose anything like that. What I would ask you folks to do is put this um, on a future agenda um, as a topic. Um, item 15 in your agenda shows other future topics. So I was hoping that this could become a future topic that you folks would discuss. Um, think about maybe bringing the PTOs here and talking about opportunities um, for positive and collaborative results in how they fundraise and, and how they're allocating and spending funding. Um, possibly consider um, some form of, I don't want to say policy, but something that expresses the district's position on, from your perspectives as a board of education, on the need to maintain facility equity uh, for the next 50 years. Um, and I would obviously, uh, since I'm bringing this up, no good deed goes unpunished, right? So if you wanted me to be a part of that conversation as um, a subcommittee or a breakout session, I'm more than happy to engage in that conversation with the PTOs, with you folks, some or all of you, uh, whatever you'd like to do. So um, I'll leave you with that thought and uh, ask that you just at least consider it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rob. And it is 8 o'clock, so if there are any students here who would like their paper signed, you've done your hour of duty.
And before we move on to the next item, are there any more comments from citizens? Next item is the consent agenda. I need a motion to approve. Um, if there's any item that would like discussion, we, we can remove that for discussion. I'm not quite sure how to handle this, but I was reading through the minutes and um, I just wanted to um, say that in around the discussion, I could find it in here, but it was around the discussion around the wait till 8th. The minutes said that the recommendation um, by that organization was that students not have a cell phone until the eighth grade, and that's not their recommendation. I, I maybe didn't communicate that properly. It's that they don't have a smartphone or data plan. They still could have a flip phone. Mm -hmm. So so we can uh, uh, remove that, and then we can uh, make the, we can approve it the next meeting. Yes. So we, we can, when the motion's made, we can remove uh, August 8th minutes. It's just the first line. Yeah. Go ahead. So I make a motion that we uh, remove the August 8th minutes from the consent agenda. Second. All in favor? So we will, so the motion be to approve consent agenda items, minutes August 21st and B, C, and D. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Next item is the second read for approval of the policy for the Narcon policy. Uh, did anybody I don't think Marianne had received any other questions on that. I'm not sure if um, if there were any other questions. I know I um, I had wanted to know if the nurses, like the high school, wanted this since they would be the ones who would need to be implementing. And they, yes, most definitely want to be able to have the ability to administer the Narcon. So that was my main question for them. I don't know if anyone else had any other questions. Uh, if there's no other questions, uh, do we have a motion? Um, motion to approve the policy 5141.213 NARCAN as, as it's submitted. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Nays. Our Narcon policy is approved. We do have the first read for curriculum. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. There's Algebra 1, Beginning Guitar, Social Studies, and Health. I did have a question about Beginning Guitar. Is that I know we are doing some music, like with guitar, at the middle school level. So, does this is this solely for high school, um, or is it could it be for high school or middle school? I don't know if it needs to be delineated. This one is for the high school. There's more day, instructional days, so we'll have an abbreviated version down the line for the the intro to guitar for the um, middle school. Mm -hmm. uh, Jen Bausch does have a, a, a very um, kind of skeletal outline for each of the encores that we'll be bringing into teaching and learning. Okay. Very good. That was my first question. If there's no other questions tonight, we can bring this back in October for a second read. Um, if people have questions, uh, during the month, please feel free to email Marianne and she'll get the answer or direct it to who can get you the answer. Next is the report of Superintendent of Schools. Yes, um, <clears throat> I'd just like to remind everyone that we have two 
very important ribbon cutting ceremonies coming up, West Vine Street School on September 21st and Dean's Mill School on September 28th. Uh, following the ceremony, there will be a time for the community to tour the schools. I know we've received a number of calls from people saying, asking when they can come in and see what's going on in the schools. So I think that'll be a, a really nice, fun morning. Um, we sent out the flyer to all of our parents and to all of our staff members. Um, there was a comment about the picture of the Dean's Mill sign. It looks like the D and the E are blotted, but those, there's, the, the signs are so shiny that it's reflecting the leaves on the tree. So it's, it's, it's fine, it was just a, a reflection. Uh, but we're looking forward to those, those days and appreciate Rob uh, inviting everybody to that. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to uh, bring up is today I sent a, a note out to all of our sports teams, all of our schools, that we will now be ending practices on our fields and asking everyone to be off at 6 p.m. Uh, it was 6.30 in the past because of the mosquito, uh, the potential for the, the disease. Um, that's a recommendation by LegeLite and it's something that we need to do as a precaution. We're also letting parents and students know that LegeLite also suggests having uh, clothing that you know, covers your arms and legs if possible and also using uh, insect repellent. Now as a school district, we can't provide the insect repellent, but certainly that's something that if parents uh, or students want to use that, that, that would be a, a suggestion from LegeLite. Um, the only other thing is as the sun sets, times change, we will be backing that time down. Uh, so this is through next week, and then after that it might go to 5.45 or 5.30. It's gonna certainly affect uh, some things, uh, some games in particular, um, but it's for student safety, so that's, uh, that's the direction. I've sent my note to uh, local, other local school districts, and I've also sent it to uh, the rec department, because I know, at least as of yesterday, they, they had the 6.30 timeline. I don't, that's up to them, but um, if they want to change, they, they probably will. Um, so we're just trying to keep our, our students and staff, and coaches, as safe as possible. And how long do we keep that in place, until the first frost? Yes. So does that mean we end the football game before it ends? Well, when it was 6.30, they, they, it has to do with when they can get a referee um, and when we can start a game. Um, Brian had rescheduled the, the two home games that are coming up to start earlier and end by 6 or 6.15. But if, if it's going to be 5.30, it's going to be difficult. So we'll, we'll just have to have to see. Because it it, it's, it's basically every district now. So it's not like we can go somewhere else and play a game. Um, so it, it could affect uh, Tomorrow's game. The sports, yeah. Um. Thank you very much, Dr. Riley. As you know, there's been a lot of moving around over the last uh, few months, and I'm told that the central office will be able to be relinquished to back to the town. Uh, they moved, started moving on Friday, and are almost all moved out. So maybe Dr. Riley can give us a little bit of an update on the moving process. We still have a lot to do at the new district office, um, but our plan is to be out of the central office, the old building, uh, by Friday, by a week from tomorrow and give it a scrub and have it look as nice as it can before we turn it over to, to the town. Uh, we still have some, a number of boxes with re old records to either shred or move, uh, but we feel Peter has that under control and will be moving not only the boxes out of that, um, that facility, but there's a lot of equipment in the current district office in the cafeteria and the gymnasium that we're gonna move to storage areas within that building. And we hope to have all that done in the next, by next Friday anyway. So we do have a recommendation, uh, a motion. Yep. Does everybody have it? Okay. 
to relinquish the building and pass it back to the town on October 1st. Um, before we make the motion, can I just say something quick? Um, I'm on the facilities committee and we had a discussion about the office because we've had a lot of really interesting discussions about what's going to happen on that land and a bunch of people are really interested. But we are, as a committee, a little not concerned, that's not even the word. Um, there was a recommendation I think made to the selectmen that we have a walkthrough of the building before it's turned over to make sure that it's in conditions that we know the gym is full of stuff that needs to be shredded in binders. I understand the shredding machines are coming this week from what we heard from Sandy or something, that they're gonna become. But there was a discussion about having a walkthrough maybe the week before to make sure that it's in, in a suitable condition to be turned over. And I don't know, I don't know where that's going. I just wanna say that, that that was brought up to the, to the selectmen, the board of selectmen, and that has nothing to do with the, the facilities committee or. Well, I, I met with Paul Sarter this week right. and um, showed him our new, our new building. Yeah, right, you said that, yeah. And also uh, we talked about have not only a walkthrough but a list of issues mm. That, um, that we know of at right. that building. So we'll certainly have that. We can set up a yeah. meeting. Peter uh, yeah. can give a, a tour of whoever would like to go to see. Absolutely. I just yeah. wanted to, to bring that up with, with, with the facilities committee discussed on Tuesday. And I'll be uh, meeting with First Selectman Simmons tomorrow, which that will be part of the discussion of what, what's the process and what do we want done and how will that walkthrough be done and all of that. So we do need a, a motion. Everyone does have it in front of them. So I put a motion to, um, I move that effective October 1st, the Stonington Board of Education relinquish controlled town of Stonington owned property located at 49 North Main, uh, North Stonington Road, Old Mystic, Connecticut, known as the administration office building, including the land, grounds, building facilities, structures, and improvements thereon to the town of Stonington. By such action, control of such property shall revert back to the town of Stonington and the Stonington Board of Education shall no longer be responsible for the care, maintenance, and operation of such property. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, I will let Mr. Simmons know tomorrow morning. <clears throat> and uh, another item along that line, we do have a lot of stuff now with the new district office, and you'll be starting to go through it. And can you just explain that we'll be going through the same policy of, of getting, handing off items that maybe we don't need? We will go through the same process. There's a, a lot of you know tables and desks and things that were <clears throat> either in Pocket Tuck Middle School or in West Broad or other or, or Mystic Middle that were reloc <clears throat> excuse me relocated to that area, uh, we'll be going through those in the next by next week. And anything that we need to save, we'll be moving to a storage room at that at the new district office. We will then notify uh, the first selectman that any town uh, employee or any department can come and take whatever they want. And after we do that, we'll go to the nonprofits and open it up like we did um, at the uh, two elementary schools. And after that, we'll open it up for the community to come in if there's anything left. And there usually is. So if you want to file cabinet, uh, get in line. Thank you very much. Next, we have monthly reports. Does anybody have any questions? I don't have a question. I just, I know Allison's not here tonight, but I wanted to congratulate Allison Van Etten, who um, was appointed to the Connecticut Dyslexia Task Force um, this month, I guess. Um, that's a really, really, really special honor. And um, it just, I feel like Stonington is moving in all sorts of, in, a positive direction in so many different areas. Um, but I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, I had that on my list as well. Thank you for mentioning that. We'll share that with her. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on the monthly reports? 
Next, we have committee reports. Uh, there is the Health Reserve Committee. Uh, I had mentioned those at our retreat and about as far as the updates and Vince and Jim from the town were on vacation and are just back. Uh, we've, uh, I think, addressed the, the paragraph. There was one paragraph that was a little bit, um, they wanted some changes made to it and now that they're back, we can certainly have that discussion. So hopefully we'll be in contact very soon to state that we're, we're all set to bring that agreement forward to the three boards. Policy committee, we're just still working on the bylaws. Yes. Um, we are not meeting this month. Right. Um, we'll meet next month and we'll finish up working on the bylaws and um, any new items that need to be addressed. Okay. Okay. Um, building committee update. Let's see, Deb has been out of town, across the pond, across the country, everywhere. Uh, it, the project obviously is um, starting to wind down. There's still punch lists going on, still some mechanical issues that are being addressed, um, but they are, are chipping away at those lists. Um, Van, do you have anything to add? That's it. Okay. Is there any comments from citizens relative to board action on this agenda? Um, items for future board agendas. Uh, on here, on our agenda, we do have the Board of Ed and Leadership Team joint meeting. We had originally stated September, October. I'm wondering what the board thinks and the leadership team thinks about November. That way it's after the election, so it, it might be a, a better time to, to almost as part of an, uh, an orientation. Um, so I wanted some opinion on that. Thank you. A really good idea. Okay, so we'll um, touch base and maybe have Anna be able to talk to Cabe and see if they have availability in November and then look at our schedules. Okay. Um, later school start time, I believe that will be going to the Teaching and Learning Committee to start uh, working on that. Uh, I know that's something that Jack and both Candace, so it's good you're both on that committee, were um, really interested in looking into. So that'll be great to have that started there. Um, central office, we already um, discussed that. Um, and also, it will have to wait until after teaching and learning meets in October, I guess. Uh, but then the board goals will come back to us in the matrix. Um, they first go to teaching and learning, then they'll come back to us. And then also, we had wanted to add that belief statement, um, adding um, some more about uh, uh, the student safety and that new policy that was adjusted uh, fits perfectly in the direction we want to go in. So perhaps we can make sure that's specifically on the um, agenda as well. Does it go ahead, Jack? Um, I was just going to ask, any, what sorry. have I missed? <laughs> uh, I know we've discussed this as a group before. Um, we had talked about the idea of having students, when they complete a class, fill out a survey at the high school. Right. And uh, I think that's something, I don't know if that would be teaching learning first and then here, but I wanted to revisit that. Sure, I, I don't see why that might not be a bad place to, to start that conversation. Um, it's a, I think it's good, as good as any. And maybe we can make sure we'll um, send that out to Dr. Riley and um, Mrs. Butler, and then can share it with the leadership team and maybe then can bring back some ideas that can come back to the Teaching and Learning Committee and then back to us as the board. And also your, um, the cell phone policy, uh, not policy, the, that was, I wanted to make sure that that was going to, on um, teaching and learning, whoo, you guys will be busy. Okay. Anything else? Can we add the PTO funding discussion? Oh, yes. To yep. the agenda. 
the PTO funding um, yeah, that Rob brought up? The, the equity. Um, we could start that at the Finance Committee, maybe, yeah. or at, and then bring it back to, and then uh, have it come to the full board. That, that We can try that and see how that works. That was a good idea. I know that we do mention in each of our budgets each year um, that part of our goal is equity, so maybe that can just be uh, further expanded a little bit in conversations. I think we've hit everything. Is there anything else? Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you. Alexandra, you've completed your first board meeting. <laughs>